This episode of Tate Facts is brought to you by Tasty Blocks, the edible toy that's sweeping the nation. Choose from a wide range of jellified treats with a taste that's to die for. Well, not literally, come on now. Few stomach ulcers, tops. Helium is the second element on the periodic table, and sits proudly atop the right-hand column like a fat duck on an ironing board. If you asked a person on the street for a random application of helium, the first thing they'd probably say is inflating balloons, or more realistically, they'd give you an awkward smile before clutching their children and walking sharply in the other direction. The reason helium is a good choice for balloons is its low density, especially when compared to the density of air. Air is best thought of as a source of gassy chemical soup. Most of it's made from nitrogen and oxygen, with water vapour, carbon dioxide, and other trace compounds make up the remaining 1%. Helium is much less dense than all of these gases, so if you let a helium balloon go outdoors, it'll start pushing its way to the upper atmosphere like a toy boat in a bath. <laughs> okay, I realised while I was writing this script, but please don't actually let go of balloons outdoors. Um, when helium balloons fall back to Earth, the robot gets eaten by birds and makes them really sick, so just, uh, just be cool, my guys. Okay, back to the episode. Now, for any aliens that may be watching, helium balloons only float because they have an atmosphere to push against. Balloons don't suspend themselves mid-air through telekinesis, so they have to be supported by heavier gases to prevent gravity from pushing them back down to Earth. For instance, if you let a helium balloon go on the moon, a place with about as much atmosphere as an open mic night in a Dignitas clinic, there will be no gas molecules in the air to support it. The second you let it go, the balloon will just disappointingly drop to the ground. Worth keeping in mind should you ever throw a birthday party in the sea of tranquility. Helium's low density is also why it makes your voice sound like this. For all intents and purposes, sound is just wiggly air. When you talk, what your body's actually doing is rapidly waggling a pair of membrane flaps in your voice box called your vocal folds. This waggling creates bursts of sound waves which are then amplified in your throat to create the unique feel, or timbre, in your voice. A sound wave can travel through air at about 344 meters a second, but in helium, a gas with much fewer bulky molecules getting in the way, this speed is nearly tripled. The change in air composition makes the higher pitch tones in your voice resonate more in your throat, and the lower pitch tones resonate less. This changes your voice to sound like, well, most people say like a chipmunk, but I'd personally compare it to the voice of a Frankensteinish hybrid of a Toy Story alien and an axe murderer. Helium was discovered in 1868 by the French scientist Pierre Janssen. An astronomer by training, Janssen had travelled to India for a research trip, and he was keeping his eyes peeled for an upcoming solar eclipse. On the 18th of August, astrophysicists had calculated that the moon would move directly in between the sun and the earth, blocking out the light like a walrus in front of a cinema projector. During an eclipse, the side of the earth facing the sun is plunged into darkness for a few minutes, creating a very pretty ring of sunlight around the shadow of the moon. Don't look at it directly though, the sun may seem dimmer during an eclipse, and while there are several safe ways to look at it, it's still an enormous fiery ball of radiation, and looking at it without adequate protection can permanently damage your eyes. However, Janssen was able to take a peek through the safety of a spectroscope, an instrument that divides visible light into its corresponding colours. For reasons we won't get into now, each element on the periodic table emits distinctive frequencies of light when absorbing energy, producing what's known as an emission spectra. Every element's spectra is different, so by studying the spectra of a compound's flame, we can deduce what elements that compound must be made of. But what Janssen saw must have puzzled him. In amongst the other spectral lines was a vivid yellow streak with a wavelength that didn't correspond to any of the data in his reference books. Janssen knew the line was too intense to be a faulty reading, so he sent his findings off to the French Academy of Sciences for analysis. Unfortunately, no one was in a position to validate Janssen's findings. There wouldn't be another eclipse for another 12 months, and the spectroscopes at the time were far too sensitive to use on a normal day. Lucky for Janssen, his findings would be confirmed a few months later by the English scientist Norman Lockyer, as in, Norman's coming over, Lockyer valuables away. After heavily modifying his spectroscope, Lockyer was able to take an eclipse-free peek at the sun, his vision helpfully shielded by the sheer degree of air pollution that existed in Victorian London. Lockyer christened the new element Helium after Helios, the Greek god of the sun whose face you can see in all good vaporwave playlists. This isn't a bit, by the way, Google if you don't believe me. Now, Lockyer assumed, incorrectly, that helium was a metal, but it was first extracted as a gas in the 1890s, and we've been bleeding the planet dry of the stuff ever since. Unfortunately, if current trends of helium consumption are kept up, we may not have enough to fritter away on balloons for long. Helium is one of the only elements on Earth that has to be produced from a non-renewable resource, which sounds odd when you consider it's the second most common element in the universe after hydrogen. While helium is comparatively common in space, this is mostly because of its high abundance in stars, where it's produced as a byproduct of nuclear fusion. Now this is all fine and dandy if you've got a mine on the surface of the sun, but as mentioned in the last video, like, subscribe and comment, hint hint, our feeble caveman brains have yet to figure out how to harness nuclear fusion on Earth. The only alternative available with present technology is to distill helium from enormous volumes of natural gas. The helium in natural gas is produced by the radioactive decay of elements like uranium and thorium deep within the Earth's crust. These helium supplies will run out if we don't come up with a solution in the next century, and they may take a millennia to replenish themselves, and that's generously assuming we don't milk the planet dry of uranium and thorium like the udder of a radioactive goat. This wouldn't be so bad if helium was only a novelty for balloon artists and Alvin and the Chipmunks fans, but as elements go, it's become a pretty critical resource for several industries. Helium-3, a rare isotope of helium, is an essential cooling agent in MRI scanners. You know, those massive donut-shaped machines used in hospitals that detect internal injuries. Since their invention in the 1970s, MRI scanners have completely turned the world of clinical diagnosis on its head. Doctors now have a tool that can help them diagnose complex 
serious conditions like spinal injuries or brain tumours without invasive tests or expensive surgeries. Unfortunately, MRI scans don't come cheap. Keeping an MRI machine in working condition can cost hospitals a small fortune over the years. In order to generate the intense magnetic fields needed to penetrate human tissue, electromagnets in an MRI machine must be kept cooled to a chilly minus 270 degrees Celsius, which is only a few degrees above absolute zero. So until chemistry finds a way to get renewable helium ticked off its bucket list, we've only got a few decades before we completely exhaust our supplies. Appreciate helium balloons while you can, folks. Life's an exercise in appreciating the little things, and take it from me, my generation's still reeling from the loss of the 10p Freddo.